Hello, welcome back to Prometheus Podcast. My name is Landon Wade. I'm one of your hosts. I'm here with Colin Burns Hello. and Sean Ju. Hello. Uh, today's episode, this is episode nine, so we're getting pretty close. We're, we're still going. Close to what? Is there an end? Well, close to ten. Close to, close nine to, is close to ten. Oh, I, yeah. I thought you were going to say close to finals. Like, thanks for reminding it's me. A, well, it's also <laughs> close to eleven, not as close to twelve and thirteen. But yeah, we're also getting close to finals. The semester is starting to... So nine's a really unlucky number. It's not that unlucky. Well, I mean, like, historically... Are we seriously like... going to have this argument right now? <laughs> All right, anyway. No, I mean, yeah, I just, it, just, it just leaked through. I'm well, sorry. we'll see when we get to episode 13. But um, anyway, so yeah, Day in the Life, we kind of already jumped into that. We are working on our reviews before the final reviews, so that, in a way, is like our finals in architecture school so we spend most of our time in our studio classes working on projects and we have reviews next week which are the last that's the last commentary or round of feedback we get from outside professors before we actually have our final review so it's kind of a big deal the professors are really pushing for us to have as much done as we can so that we have less work to do or, or we can do more of the fine tuning the details things now like the that. modeling's really coming into the play yeah yeah now now more models are being made and things like that in our construction class we just finished a project that we have been building wall sections so basically if you were to take a pie slice out of a building and then pull it out and look at it and see the structure that's inside of it that's those are models that we just got done yeah building in our construction <clears throat> class um so that's kind of what's going on that was pretty stressful not many people slept last night because they were working on yeah, well, I, slept Colin, like a, I slept like a baby last night. Yeah, Sean slept like a baby. Uh, I was up till pretty late. Colin was up till pretty late doing those models, and uh, but they got done, and we we turned everything in, so we're good. So now we're relaxed, podcasting. Not really, but yeah, a little bit more relaxed, <laughs> less less not relaxed, <laughs> less not relaxed. <laughs> yeah, less stressed than we were twenty four hours ago. So. Anyway, today's episode, we have a pretty interesting topic. Um, we try to include topics that that naturally occur in our own conversations when we're walking to and from classes on campus and things like that. This conversation happened, or the introduction to this topic happened in a conversation we were having. It was on uh, Thursday, I think. And, uh, so yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. It's, time flies, you know? Yeah. You just never know. Time doesn't fly. It's just your brain is flying. My brain is, <laughs> yeah, it's like, architecture school is like drugs. It's just like your brain is just like everywhere. Um, it should be legal, illegalized. Yeah. Um, so we this this topic was kind of interesting. My, my, uh, my wife posed the question to Sean if, you know, what, what the meaning behind architecture is. If it if it is an assigned meaning or if it is a meaning that is inherent to the architecture. So, to clarify, kind of what she was trying to say is is does architecture, as soon as it's built, does it come with a meaning, or is that a meaning that is kind of taught to us by other people or by um, some type of intuition? So, kind of where I guess the real question behind all of that is where does the meaning in architecture come from? the people that use it right well, well i mean that's i when she asked that question it really reminded me of l literature and reading books like i think the whole basis of what literature is and what fictional novels are to us is a proof that we are all different and we are all unique because what, what could be a book that all three of us have read um, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird. We there all, we go. All three of us read To Kill a Mockingbird. Technically, I didn't. Read I bet it. none of us thought of the thought of that book and thought of the message of that book as the same. True. Some people thought it was a great way to send a message out for the still existing racism. Yeah. Some people thought it was a great way to show the growth of a person. When True. Yeah. faced with a conflict, yeah, the others could have thought that it was a great way. It was a great generation generational change from a wiser, older person to more of a reckless and free younger person, and passing on the responsibility of the real uh, reality. 
Mm. So it's it, the messages are diff- differently conceived by us. And when we get to that point, it's really hard to answer that question with a simple answer. And that's why I thought it was a really interesting topic to talk about. Well, I mean, so taking that directly to architecture, I mean, the first thing I thought of when you, when you mentioned that, kind of explained that, that analogy, is uh, the use of certain, um, man, they're, they're not building types. I guess they are technically Apology. building types. Yeah, but the, 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 just the things, you know, those things we learned in history class, yeah. you know, like about the apps, APSE, the apps, the use of that in... Um, and yeah. church architecture throughout history. So, you know, the start of it, for example, the start of it was with the Greeks. And within the apps, they they would praise their their gods. You know, that was kind of, that was where, wherever you placed the higher power was within the apps. Mm-hmm. And so it started with the Greeks, and so it, it was Greek gods. And then you moved on to Roman gods. And then the, the Romans took it and used that. And then... You move on to Christian gods, yeah, and then so it's it's like what, what it is called the technically the term historically speaking this is this is me trying to be the most historian like as I can is oh. it's technically called um, reappropriation. So that that same that same thing it's the same like literally the same structure has been used over and over but for different things. Yeah. So it's just like you were saying that book has different meanings to each I of mean, us. To make it even easier and real life applicable, you see that a lot in car manufacturing companies, especially the ones that are born in wartime periods in World War II. Mercedes-Benz thrived on being one of the best military vehicles, and now it's one of the more luxury vehicles. Hmm. It's the same exact engineering, same exact planning, and same exact durability, but now it's been reappropriated into a luxury brand rather than something that's um, shown more of a durable and more down-to-earth sort of cars. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. Well, I, so the, the, I guess the weird thing is, is whether you think about it or not, maybe if you, if you don't think about it as specifically when it comes to the apps in the architecture of churches and, and temples, it's not just... It really, to all of those people, it still meant power mm-hmm. or like a higher power. Even, even later on when the U.S. government starts to use it at the beginning of, you know, the United States of America. You they're using it in a capital building. a lot in the government buildings. Exactly. It, it becomes, it's still a higher power. Yeah. So that, it, that, same, that same point is still communicated. So you did, also see them in plantation homes, just to a little <laughs> well, historical. No, it is true. Well, yeah. yeah. Plantation any, pl- any plantation home that you go to that's still erected has that on their front porch. It's the first thing you see coming from the road is that really tall columns with that sort of apse. With normally it's blank, but it's just, it just symbolizes the whole power. I think in a meeting they didn't really understand that that's what it meant, but you know, I mean, a, with all those buildings and they share a common theme of there's somebody superior and there are people that are inferior. True, or something. Some I guess thing. the gov- well, yeah. like, the, the government counts as people, I guess, but um, it, both, well, it counts as people and a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, but there's always going to be something that's above and something that's below. I think the whole point of the apps being so tall and magnificent, and making and, and therefore making the person so small and insignificant, I think that really sends a message. As a building, and that's not even how you perceive it. I think that it, that to a scale of a building really sends a message to everybody that there is a superiority and inferiority in this. Well, so the question is now, or I guess what I'm thinking is, does the has the apps survived as an architectural device? Is it still here? Because it absolutely it has been taught to be kind of a tradition. Because I know for one, it's tradition, and but secondly, it works. It's it's seen that that it it was an effective device, and so it continued to work. So I guess the thing is, if it 
if it was just a meaning that was taught to people, you'd think that would have been lost within a few hundred years, maybe. Yeah. But here we are, you know, two, three thousand, thousand years later, still using the same thing. So it's kind of like, okay, so is that is that something that we perceive intuitively and perceive power, or has it really just been that the passing on of that meaning has been so strong? I mean, I believe that both of you have been to churches for the occasionally the Sunday schools and yeah. whatever. I mean, I have I've definitely been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I've been to, ch- I've been to church, <laughs> and I've been to Sunday schools, and yeah. all that. But I think <clears throat> because as a kid, go to Sunday school, and you know you're kind of reckless, loud, going places, and you're told to be quiet, and you're told to you know keep it down and keep it sacred mm-hmm. in the church premises. And I think those could have, and I'm not saying those could have a major impact on how you perceive the meaning behind the architecture and the power. But I think those could be one of those minor details that could have a butterfly effect into something bigger. So I guess we, what you're saying is that the culture is what passes that mm-hmm. meaning along. Because yeah. no matter what you kill, the culture always survives. Huh. Because culture isn't something that you can just get rid of. It's not like books that you can just burn off it's not like people that you can just line up and shoot and kill it's culture always lives even if there's one or two people that survives in that whole entire race it gets passed down i want to say back to the the church idea not to say that you're wrong but i think that implication of the church should be a calm place doesn't have an impact on the architecture but the space not the actual yeah. architectural features but just the space that you are involved in whether the church is a box or some great greek you know revival church it's more so focused on the importance of the space within the structure yeah i think i don't think we can ignore the spacing of the church because I mean, it's a very common. I think it's a very common theme with big church, especially with big churches, not the not the small neighborhood churches. With those those things, are, I think most of the small neighborhood churches are just developed residential homes yeah. most of the time. Yeah. But big churches that are made to that are built the to be churches. churches yeah. yeah. I think the common layout plan is usually sort of a not long corridor, but narrow corridor entrance. The yeah. nave. Yeah. yeah, and then. And then you're introduced to all of a sudden this big, yeah. enormous space compared to the narrow yeah. nave yeah. that you walk through. And then I think it just – it puts me in awe, especially the chapel that we – um the Air Force Chapel in Colorado. Oh, man. that that I think that place really serves that theme well because you go in and you don't directly see the this great giant building at first. You walk down this little sort of tunnel, arch tunnel, and then all of a sudden you're introduced to this ginormous space that just puts you in awe. That is true. And well, I-, I feel like they want to create that, that sort of barrier, like you're walking in from the outside world, because that's the it's Catholic, it's a Catholic I- chapel, so I feel like it's a barrier or a buffer zone to where you walk in from the outside world. Cleanse yourself of all of the, you know, outerly things, I'll, and then press into the chapel, and it's just. I always think of those little, the nave entrances as the pediments to the Greek temples. Yeah. Because the pediments are supposed to, symbolically they're supposed to be the cleansing space. They're supposed to separate this holy temple from this filthy world yeah, it's kind of like in the mosque where yeah. you have the washroom before you step into yeah. the mosque you have to be clean well and i'm in additionally uh in in christian cultures you know there's there's christ stating that that the way is narrow mm-hmm. you know that kind of a thing or or uh just, just that, like the righteous path isn't easy. You know, it's it's a hard one to go to yeah. pass through. So, and it's interesting that that has permeated to several cultures because we just listed what four or five religions yeah. right there, and but it's still there. And like so, the cultures so, that we listed are 
long and far apart. Well, so you could argue that those architectural devices, that meaning has been somehow prescribed, like but even before, you know, possibly even before the Greeks. But I think part of it, part of the reason that the Greeks, uh, those meanings and those devices moved forward were just because of the civilization that was developing there. Mm -hmm. Because, because you know, it, it became this, the pancake stack of time, you know, first the first pancake. I mean, even before the Greeks, but the first one we're talking about in this conversation, you've got the Greeks, and then the Romans are on top of that, and then you and get the Christians, and then the Christians, Christians like, slash Islam. Yeah, so you just keep like layering on top of one another. Scientology over pop. But because of that, they respect what came before. They they look at these old cultures, see what worked, and that worked yeah. for some reason. But but it. It's just so interesting that even spread out in several different cultures, those devices work. And so not, where does that meaning come from? And where it comes from, I don't think anybody can give a clear, decisive answer. That's it. Yeah, I'm, I think I think the spaces were stra strategically laid out. Well, so I, you can feel the greatness and this awing space of the majesty. Well, I I think it's interesting. One thing you don't perceive until you really start to pay attention to space yeah. is that it really does affect your feelings and your emotions, like how you are in a space. And so I think that what you're talking about, just the the uh, the scale of yeah. some of those of some of those it, old Catholic it's cha so chapels. It's so ridiculously you're so ridiculously outscaled in those things. Well, yeah, and I mean, you look at you look at a, a cross section of one of these chapels, and you you can't find the scale figure almost. Yeah, you know, because so you know, in in these drawings, you'll see you're holding you know an eight and a half by eleven, a, a, a letter sized piece of paper. The building is as tall as the paper, basically, yeah. right? In, in this drawing, and the person is like. Maybe the lead on your pencil I mean, tall. It's just, very, I mean, and so you, you almost lose like where the person is in the drawing because it's just immense. I recommend everybody to look at the section of the Notre Dame of Paris yes. with yeah, scale figures in there because it, it, is, it is absolutely ridiculous how big that building is compared to how big a person could be. Well, and it's, it's very interesting that, that that type of power and meaning has just has permeated. Mm-hmm completely it's just it's gotten completely transferred and so i guess that's a question we may have to just leave unanswered because yeah. it's it really is a, a difficult thing like, i think some things i think some sorts of beauties are just great and they do all well without being answered i don't think everything in life has to be answered well and i think there is a lot of value in how someone feels in a space though mm -hmm. because there are spaces that when you walk into them, you feel dominant. And there are spaces that when you walk into, you feel submissive. Yeah. And, and there is a reason. You look at the way religion, for example, has changed through time. And that they go from, you know, the, the, the ancient Roman Catholic Church back in, you know, the year 300, stuff like that. You go from these churches that, that basically is the government, mm -hmm. is powerful... And there's this huge like class separation. So you have like government officials, priests, and they're all up there, and then it's it's just this pretty wide chasm between them and the population. Yeah. So you've got that. But then as time goes along, that separation, that gap closes, and then as soon as it really starts as soon as those two start cross pollinating, you start to have this change in architecture you start to have smaller scale architecture and i'm assuming it also has to do with colonization and things like that because in a colony you're not going to build a massive chapel well, like I mean, you yeah in Europe. you're not going to want to spend that much money in a colony that you're not even sure how long you can hold on to it for exactly so I, I think that played a role and and the fact that as as religion changed and as ideas changed you think of all of the new you know the enlightenment and um the great awakening these these other pieces of history that have changed attitudes completely they start they start to affect yeah. the architecture because instead of the architect wanting someone to walk in and feel small or insignificant they want someone to walk in and feel like they're part of a community or they want someone to walk in and feel like and generally they're the valued ceiling height usually gets lower and lower for yeah. those kind of buildings well and that's the thing it's like most i feel like most people have just don't 
even don't even think about it. I think it's a really great point because, like, uh, I'm not gonna put this in a religious perspective, yeah. but in a sort of commercial culture perspective, where, <clears throat> so you see all these big, high, uh, tall high towers that are owned by offices and con- conglomerate. Conglomerates. Conglomerates. Yeah, conglomerate. I can't. I can never pronounce that word. That's right. a hard word to pronounce. <clears throat> but those conglomerate companies. Yeah. And those buildings are basically the skyscraper. They really are reaching for the sky. Mm-hmm. And and then you see companies like Google and these modern day companies that really show, really sort of emphasize the importance of the quality. In workplace, I wouldn't even say. And don't, and I mean not equality, but I would like to like they wanted to feel like you're actually part of a family. Yeah. Not not even just equal, but you're closer than equal. But the but the power but the power ranking doesn't go vertically in those companies. Power ranking goes horizontally, and those companies usually have one or two floor headquarters that aren't tall at all. If you look at Google headquarters, it's what one, two, three floors maybe. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, you know, we visited uh, in Houston when we visited McCoy. Yeah. You remember that? It was kind of, and again, I think that relates because it starts to become less of the boss and the being bossed. Yeah. And it starts to become the community, the teamwork. Mm Mm-hmm. And so for some reason, like that correlates with ceiling height, we've found. Or we've, I mean, it's, it is a strange correlation. Not Not, every, not not every single thing, but. Yeah. We, if we, if we take the best out of each yeah there are strong examples branches yeah you could easily argue that that is so interesting um but i mean yeah like meaning behind things have to be varied by a person yeah and it's not even by a group or a community it varies by a person like we could talk about films and how it differently impacts all of us there's I think we all watched The Inglorious Bastards, at least a scene of it. Yeah. And the very beginning scene hit me, hit Landon. I know it hit Landon because I was the one that showed him. <laughs> hit Colin. Was, it was intense. And it was an intense scene, that very beginning scene. But <clears throat> it all hit us in different ways because I was very – I was in my comfort zone when I was watching that scene. I was absolutely blown away and very comfortable. And I was able to really focus in that scene. But, I mean, Landon, how, how's your, well, no, that how's scene, your emotion? Well, so, if, yeah, for those of you who haven't seen, I, I really recommend that scene was, was really, so it is the first scene. I, don't, I didn't the know The very scene. beginning scene. So it is the very beginning scene of Inglorious Bastards. This, um, chapter one. Yeah, chapter one. Um, it's, a, it's an extremely tense and powerful scene. And it, I think uh, my my reaction to it, Sean has seen it what like a million I've times. I've seen it two a million lot. times. Um, my reaction to it, I guess, wasn't the same as Sean's. Partly because it was the first time I was seeing it, and because I think I was feeling more, maybe I was putting myself more in the shoes of of the protagonist or of of who seems to be the protagonist yeah. at the time, and uh, and Sean because he's seen it so much is pulling back. Because afterwards, Sean continues to he you know, he proceeds to tell me about you know the the shots and the angles and the colors in the film. So he starts to look at it from this really analytical standpoint, really the objective. So he's pulled point away. Of view on that. But either way, so I, the way I'm seeing it is we both have these specific reactions, but both of those fit within this really poised category. Yeah. So I guess, like I'm saying, and or. The point I'm trying to get at is while everybody has their own specific reaction to certain things, there are other things that undeniably, as humans, we react in the same general way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that, that is hard to define. It's hard to monitor. But there are definitely certain things that we just are prone to feeling certain ways around certain types of film, for example, or, yeah. or reading certain types of books or seeing certain things happen. But... It goes the same for architecture, and I think that's partly partly where the meaning in architecture comes from, because anybody walking into a massive space will feel small. Mm-hmm. 
whether whether them feeling small is like a a, a feeling of humility or a feeling of belittlement, you know. Yeah, that's a nice word. That's, that's a nice word. That's up it. to the person, but they feel small nonetheless. And so I think it's it's just super interesting how much power there is behind architecture because of that general control that you can have over meaning and things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it just it really becomes powerful. And as a designer, how do you use that? <clears throat> a lot of things are. I think I think a lot of things are strategic, especially because those buildings have common themes and common layouts. Yeah, like it's just the same as the skyscrapers having the core in the middle with elevators. True. And those big, ginormous churches and cathedrals are going to have the high tip. Well, they have the they have the uh, the nave. Yeah, the nave and the apse and the domes and the and domes. All. Yeah, because those things are shared. And that is strategic. Now, I think it's a designer's job on how to make that into a, an experience that you want the viewers to have. Do you want, like, as some architects want, still want those massive spaces, the un, almost unscaled feeling yeah. in spaces, but they want it to be a pleasing experience for the viewers, some some architects will want it to be the most uncomfortable and belittling experience that the viewers can have, and those things. <clears throat> I think I think that's where the artistic side of architecture comes in. Is how are you going to manage those spaces in and manipulate people's emotions instead of what they actually see? <laughs> thinking about thinking manipulate about manipulate like, their yeah, emotions. I mean, I mean, you are in a turn manipulating. No, it's it's, I I mean I can't disagree with that. It is it is really true that this really is a a piece of architecture or an element in architecture that I is really dear to me, just because um, that's why I I started architecture. I I originally this can get personal here. I'm get, just really quick personal story. You have I 10 originally seconds. I have ten seconds. I originally was going to uh, to be a car designer because I, I love I love cars I love designing things like that. But uh, I, as I became a man and matured, <laughs> so about two weeks ago you became yeah. a man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so as as I started to get to know myself a little bit better, I, I realized that I needed to have an emotional element in my work because to make it really satisfying to me. And and while I love cars. I, I love cars, but I'm not passionate about them, and I'm not passionate about them because they don't change. They don't change people's lives like someone's home does, um, and they don't change people's lives like an experience does. And this has gone confirmed several times in my life because I remember a lot more an experience than I do an object, um, which I guess is starts to become this. You know, we could talk about that in just a second, the experience versus the object mm -hmm. in what we're talking about, in the meaning that's behind it. But that's why car design to me started to become really just objective. You know, it was, it was what was fast or fuel efficient or like quote unquote cool looking. You know, it wasn't like somebody sits into a car, sits in a car and they, they are like, wow, this is changing my life. Maybe the drive in a car will change your life, but that's the experience. And that comes down to pure engineering. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, okay, well, numbers, like, no thanks. I want to do something that becomes, that really is this dealing with the, the non-tactile element, which is the emotion and feeling. So that's, that is why I started to get so interested in architecture. And there's some backstories I could share about that later. I've, I have a feeling we can talk about the meaning behind architecture for a couple more segments later on. Maybe we'll do a part two and three or something. <laughs> but, uh, but I, so it's interesting because you have the object mm -hmm. versus the experience. And most of what we've been talking about is the experience. Yeah. And I think the meaning of the object, so if you look at a dome, for example, you think capital building, you think church building, but that is an object. Mm -hmm. But then you look at the space within that dome and that starts that's to experience. create that's the experience and and i mean that's part of the reason why i think louis Kahn is such a great architect which is yeah. because he hurt oh man puts puts those two things down in a perfect balance Create. Yeah. he he doesn't create an experience he creates a moment 
Well, and, and there is there are certain objects you can place in architecture that help with the experience because there is always a connotation with an object. You know, there's always a connotation. Like, because like when I say triangle, what do you think about? Triangle. Triangle. I think like immediately I think like traffic cones or children's toys. Drawing or, triangle. Yeah, or a drawing triangle. <laughs> I mean, Call. warning signs. Warning signs. Hazard See, signs. yeah. So there's, you think an object, there's always a whole stack of other objects or other meanings behind that. Yeah. But when I, I, for one, I can't say like, I can't summarize the space we're sitting in right now with words. There are only feelings that can really communicate that. And so because that's such a more, yeah. that's a deeper language, there can't be really like connotations or like quickly relatable things so that when you go in, it it's an experience you don't use words to describe it so it's it's this kind of interesting it's a, i don't know my mind's kind of being blown right now so i'm what colin's smiling his glasses are doing the thing that they do when they when he smiles i don't know it, it's hard to put into words um i think to me like why i got into architecture was to you can make spaces, but not to define those spaces, because what I think of architecture, I think architecture should be open to the meaning of what whatever that person wants it to be. I don't want to have to define a space in, on the hope that the people that occupy that space see it the same way, because they're not. I want to leave it open to, to me, what I would find most gratifying as an architect is to build a building and just see how everybody else perceives it or how they experience it in their own way. Yeah. Which is what I feel like should happen instead of trying to, um, I guess, uh, specify only one meaning or experience per se, which I feel like a lot of buildings try to do now is they only want you to feel this one thing yeah. when you walk into the space that they have built for you or designed. Well, that's a whole different design challenge than I've been thinking about this whole time. I think, I well, I mean, I didn't choose architecture because of a certain reason. I just I mean, like, you <laughs> get can started have, with me. I think the best way to go about doing something like that, because you know, most people when you design a project, you want to attach how you want people to feel when they walk in the space. They want you want them to feel this way. Yeah. And I think a way to go about that to change that or maybe make it more open to more views is to not have such specific goals yeah you can have maybe a broad feeling you want like you know <coughs> like a hat like happy happy has so many like you were talking about like triangle happy has so many different sub feelings to it yeah so i mean it, i don't know not just trying to specifically narrow down and that's i think that's the same reason why i started to really appreciate architecture it's because i think architecture in a sort of fine-toned way is kind of like directing a movie. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid fan for yeah. any kind of film. I am too. But yeah. really, the job of job as an architect and job as a movie director kind of comes down to how are you going to build this up and how are you going to explode? How are you going to make people go crazy? And then how are you going to get people down safely? Yeah. It's, it, I, and I think... <clears throat> And that's the, that's the beginning and climb and the climax and the resolution. How are you going to really get those things into a perfect balance so people don't complain afterwards? Because, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the biggest thing is yeah. that there isn't a fine definition of how you should play with those things, how you should... There's not a definition of how long you should make your introduction, how long you should make your um, build up, how long you you should make your climax or resolution. But yeah, there is. Have a, you ever seen Australia? Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> there, there is a certain, there is a certain common notion that maybe this is too long. Yeah. Maybe this is too little. Maybe this is too much. And I really think, and this is the artistic side of architecture coming out where. You are really the composer, the director, the captain of the ship. And as, as an architect, those things create that experience and even so much fine-tuned as a moment that it is. 
I don't know how much this has to do with the topic, but like creating, and in terms of architecture and creating spaces to create certain feelings, I remember when I was designing our interior design project for my creative process class, we were designing, we were essentially redesigning a play area for a Sunday school at a church for kids second through fifth grade. I don't know what age that is, like seven to 12, maybe seven to 11. Something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In an interesting way, I found to think about it, and I've kind of started to think this way when I design for my studio projects as well, is just thinking back to whatever specific, specific group you're designing for, thinking about what you liked or what you remembered enjoying at that age. Yeah. So when I was designing this, I just remember thinking, like, what did I really enjoy as a kid? Reading books? Normal kids. Not, yeah, normal not kids. Not <laughs> Sorry, sorry that I like reading books as a kid. I, I thought that was a normal thing. So but yeah, just like for me, it'd be black and white. Yeah, I mean, just trying to because I feel like so many architects. I, I see it so much in studio too. They try to design a project that is just so intricate, and they want it to be the coolest looking building they can design. They want to be the next Zaha, the making these organic flowing. Just really weird and outstanding and outlandish buildings, but it doesn't really hit the point of who's who's going to be occupying the building. Yeah, what what difference is it going to make to them? Yeah, yeah and I feel like that's where we some architects lose. I don't want to say credibility, but street creds, baby, well, they, street creds. Let's say yeah, street cred. I think is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I just threw that out there for fun. <laughs> I don't know the professional term for it, but street cred <laughs> is you're just designing a building that looks good, but it has the people that occupy it don't have any, you know, real and emotional attachment or feeling or experience to it. It's just to them, it's another building. I think this is a great time. I, I, to... I don't want to cut you off, but no, no, no. Like my dad, my dad works at FedEx. <coughs> okay. I've yeah. been in my dad's office thousands of times. Yeah. Talk about generic office building. It is square. You walk in, the Gross. whole middle is filled with cubicles, and there's offices that line the corners. Every office has the same window in the same spot, desk attached to the wall in the same spot, same cabinet, same chairs. And you walk into it, and I walk in there now after joining, <laughs> ar after being in architecture school for this long, I walk in there and just go, how can you come here and work? It is the most boring place. It's all artificial. Like, how, can, how can you? I think this is a great time to turn into the uh, meaning behind modernism. Oh my gosh, that that's a whole dude. That's like a whole. F that that's is like a whole let's, ten episodes. Let's do no, let's do a, let's do a five to ten minutes. Okay, well we we I feel like if we're gonna crack say, that egg say open, make that another episode. That's gonna yeah, be we can depth. we can we can briefly just like talk about. Some modern one sentence summary. Yeah, one on sentence how summary this relates to the of what, of what we think yeah. about modernism. Form follows function. He thinks form follows function. I think the irony of modernism is that like its meaning and significance is to clean the slate of the meaning and significance that was set beforehand. Yeah, so, I, agree with that. I think it's a swimming duck. <laughs> Sitting or swimming? Swimming. Because you know, you see all the ducks swimming in the pond, yeah. and they're so peaceful, and they're just floating underneath. But the then underneath, their feet are just going nuts to just even keep them floating. And I think that's what <laughs> I think that's what modernism is, because it it's it doesn't have fancy ornaments like it did in classicism. It doesn't it doesn't emphasize the importance of space like all the architecture. El that's arguable. Have well, I mean that's. Just let him finish. Yeah, no, I know. Sorry. I, when I say modernism, I'm thinking more of a commercialism. Okay. And, and that's why I threw in form follows function. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm thinking office spaces. Not, oh, yeah. Not yeah. like... Yeah, I mean, you can have all the, like, Robert yeah. Meyer... Mm -hmm. Oh, I shouldn't say his name. But you can have all the... Sp but when it comes to those buildings, I think it really is the architecture's way and architects' ways to sort of save architecture even in even in the burnt ashes of it really save whatever there's left in architecture and not let it be forgotten by the people I think modernism is the effort but we can talk about this 
some other time. We need to. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah we're we're over forty minutes now. That was a pretty good discussion. I I think there definitely will be more episodes considering, you know, more of this the source of the meaning behind architecture, and and the source of meaning, especially you know modernism in and of itself. That's that can be like a whole season or something yeah. we can do, but um, holy crap! But anyway, yeah, yeah we we have uh, since our last podcast received a lot of good feedback from one of our good friends. So we, you know who you are. Thank you for your good feedback. Love and, you. Yeah, we love you a lot. We miss you. Um, and also uh, to those of you who are new listening, we we're really excited to have any feedback you have for us. Comment, post, share. Ask questions. Ask too. questions. Any questions. Don't be participate. shy. Participate. Don't be shy because it just, man, it's a lot cooler for us when you participate. So it's going to be awesome. And uh, thanks for listening from us here at Pod- Prometheus Podcast Studios. We thank you. And we Studio will s- with a dishwasher running. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our dishwasher's running in the background. Yeah, we will uh, catch you next week then. We'll see you all later.